Caviar has a multi-award winning history in theater, film, television, and radio. It is eclectic writing from the co-creation of political satire to dreaming up allegorical musicals have been published by Telenom Books and the Canadian Theater Review. As a director, actor, he has worked for professional companies, festivals across Canada, as well as appearing in numerous television and film productions. Camiar is the founder of the New World Theater, one of Canada's acclaimed independent theater companies. He has also worked as an artist, broadcaster, and educator. He took a three-year hiatus from the professional arts circuit to work in social services and explore life outside the theater. Currently, Camiar is the arts coordinator of, for Richmond, BC, and also has a shingle up for a positive workplace consulting practice called Three Cups of Chai. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, let's try this. I'll need this like this. Can everyone hear me now? Is that good? Thank you very much, Dr. Lahab. Thank you so much for ha having me, and it's been wonderful listening to the people and the conversations. Um, I, I can't step into my artist mode without being a little bit of a diva and uh, getting you guys to actually, I'm going to ask a favor for us to get out of lecture uh, style a little bit and I'm going to ask everyone to move forward and sit as close as possible here. Uh, I'm going to sit down with you for a bit before I stand up and do the reading from my play. So if I could just ask everyone to gather around, just get a little bit more intimate with me. There's some seats. You're, you're fine in your seats there. There's some seats in the front here. Especially Dr. Lahab's students. You're not allowed to hide in the back there anymore. I'm going to get you to come forward. And uh, I have a, uh, one little disclaimer is that uh, I'm, my, my, my current job is what I like to call an autocrat, as opposed to a bureaucrat for the city of Richmond. And for reasons that you will find out in the next 40 minutes or so, I have to say that I am in no way representing the city of Richmond right now. <laughs> <laughs> I set up this play for you, but I, show, I, I thought I'd, I'd show you a little bit. Uh, the suitcase that, uh, that Ali and Ali are opening up there is... Uh, is a suitcase that Osama bin Laden gives to them on stage uh, because they just finished pitching to Al Qaeda a, a better brand management. <laughs> uh, they called it Al Qaeda 2.0. And uh, Osama liked it so much that he came and uh, comes on the stage and gives them sponsorship. Uh, to their dismay, they find out that it's a bomb. <laughs> but, uh, um, and, Osama bin Laden was played by an actor who plays an actor who's so desperate that we give him a job in our play. And he's white and we treat him like a slave the whole time, very horribly. Lots of microaggressions and macroaggressions. Um, so my talk today before my reading focuses on the, the role of humor, specifically satire, in times of conflict. Um, I want to illustrate uh, my personal opinions, of course, by recounting some thoughts and stories surrounding the development of this play. And then I'm going to read an excerpt from it. Um, and also just to note that we were invited here in 2004 as part of our tour and played and performed this play actually to sold out audiences in uh, the Benke Center for the Performing Arts in 2004. Just a little local reference. I actually uh, had my appendix out, so I ended up in the audience, and, and <coughs> our director, who's Argentinian, stepped in. Uh, it didn't matter. The audience, me or him, it didn't really matter, so he did a good job. Go to the next slide, please. So, um, in order for me to be able to read from the play, because it was a child of 9-11, it's really important for me right now, I felt, to reestablish the context for you all. 
in terms of why we, why we wrote the play in the way that we wrote it. Um, my friend Marcus, oops, uh, if we go back one, sorry. That's not Marcus. There. My friend uh, Marcus Youssef, sorry, that was my fault. And I were two young uh, theater and film types, or younger theater and film types, who also did some occasional broadcasting gigs for the uh, CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting <coughs> Corporation. And they asked us to write our, um, a radio piece and our reactions as, as men of Middle Eastern background to what was happening in Vancouver at the time with uh, post 9-11. And um, they were imagining an earnest story about two good hyphenated Canadian boys from the Middle East coping with fear and dejection in what was fast becoming what we felt a very hostile environment. Um, we told them right off the bat that we would only agree to do something if they let us be satirical. Um, and to our and we wanted to, the freedom to push boundaries and we said to them that we wouldn't accept any censorship beyond what was the normal standards of Canadian broadcasting in terms of um, uh, normal standards of censorship, I suppose, <laughs> as opposed to what was fast becoming the norm in terms of what you were allowed to say and not say in reaction to 9-11 at the time. Uh, to our surprise, they agreed. I think because they knew that only a handful of people will listen to the broadcast that we were doing, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, they agreed. Um, so we did that. I think I will go to the next slide. Uh, so we wanted to do satire because the papers and pundits at the time even in Vancouver had declared that satire is dead and they went on that humor was not appropriate because 9-11 was the most despicable atrocity in the history of humanity and we were irreversibly changed. In fact, any dissenting view was discouraged. It wasn't enough to merely be horrified at and disgusted by what had happened. You had to swear allegiance to the idea that there was nothing more horrific. Any questions of that creed, questioning of that creed was an admission of complicity with the terrorists. Remember the line in the sand? And in October of uh, 2001, which was only a month after 9-11, uh, Dr. Sunera Tobani, uh, who was a very respected feminist professor at the University of British Columbia, that's her picture there. Um, I didn't know her, but this whole incident had a very, very profound effect on me and my impetus to, to, to write this play with my partners. Um, she delivered a speech as part of a, a, a women's conference at the university in which she, if you read it now, you'd say quite reasonable and very, not very offensive, but she questioned the framing of the attacks and the war frenzy that was being created at the time. Um, she was immediately vilified. Um, uh, she was brought up against uh, hate, uh, um, hate investigations. She was uh, a victim of uh, death threats. People would send her pornography to her private email, and. Um, our main newspaper, the Vancouver Sun, and I remember this very, very distinctly, uh, printed a picture of her giving the speech that the editors had quite obviously stopped motion. Because you can see she seems like a lovely lady, but they had stopped motion her in a part of the speech where she was animated. But they had crafted it, and it was front page on the paper, that she looked like a horrible witch. Or <laughs> like she looked, she looked demonic. She looked like a terrorist. And um, it was quite grotesque. And this was sleepy, small, civilized Vancouver. And indeed, it was no joke. Suddenly, for us and people like us, Marcus, myself, our cozy and safe existence nestled within the arms of green and glorious trees of the Pacific Northwest was facing an ex existential crisis. There were a few days after 9-11 that even I, I consider myself a fully assimilated um, 
Canadian who was born in Iran, but at a very young age came out. I was bilingual from the time I learned to speak. Uh, lived in England, lived in uh, New York. Um, was kind of indistinguishable. I could pass as Jewish or Italian or, but nevertheless, I, I and some of my friends had a very visceral empathy at that time for what it must have felt like to be Japanese facing internment in the time of World War II. And that's when we as young political satirists and, and theater people decided to defend ourselves using our, our pens and as uh, our, our, my, my Jewish cousins like to say, a lot of chutzpah. Um, or, well, I guess it was our, our typewriters. Get into the reading soon. So, my, we can move to the next slide, please. These are some pictures from the play. So, my collaborators and I were, were aghast at the outrageous <laughs> theater that was being created by characters that were at once Shakespearean villains and vaudevillian buffoons. And I'm talking about the Cheneys and the Rumsfelds, and of course, George W. himself, and not to mention the likes of Osama bin Laden and, 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 and his cohorts. And again, context is really important. I, I really want to stress that this was a period prior to the John Stewarts and the Bill Mars being ubiquitous on TV. Um, and, and, and all the send up of politicians that we, we see all the time now and that is most recently manifested in things like uh, Alec Baldwin's portrayals of Donald Trump. Nobody was doing this to our knowledge back then because you literally were not allowed to do it. Um, but we weren't so much interested in jokes as we were in exposing the absurdity of the situation. Um, And what would become eventually our clownish shen shenanigans, how they paled in com comparison. Um, we were frustrated that no one was noticing this vulgarity at the time that was on display before us all the time. Uh, before there were called bears on The Daily Show, uh, there was just us and perhaps other unknowns in little cities all over the world who were up to the same sort of things. And so we were sort of like the vagabond performers who entertained the rabble before the true court jesters, like the John Stewarts and Colberts, um, came to life and helped take the pressure cooker off a little bit, the steam off the pressure cooker a little bit. Um, one notable exception was a satirical piece written in The Guardian by Armando Iannucci and Chris Morris in 2002. I, I, some of you might know Armando Iannucci. He's got a recent film out called The Death of Stalin, for instance, which is on Netflix, and he's a satirical English writer. And the concept of the piece was um, a daily diary of the political reaction to 9-11. So he had written this piece, and each day there was like little sound bites of what his reflection was. And each day was more ridiculous than the last. So I'm going to read a short excerpt from that piece prior to reading my own. And the name of the piece was uh, Terror's March Backwards, Six Months That Changed the World by Armando Iannucci and Chris Morris. And this was written in 2002. So that's one year after Sumer, uh, Dr. Tobani's speech. It's a really short one. October 7th, Bush announces the start of Operation Bomb Islamics. He tells the US that coalition members agree this title is not offensive to good Muslims. This is confirmed in a hastily written episode of The West Wing in which a good Muslim is played by Jeff Goldblum. So, <laughs> sadly my friends and I had not come across this article at the time, we would have surely stolen from him, but there were many, many outraged reactions uh, and people writing into The Guardian and The Observer that published the, the piece at the time. That the saying that the paper had gone too far Again, this is in 2002 now, that it was too soon to laugh even a year later. But the piece also had its defenders, and one letter writer opined, it had been the thing months before 9-11 never to smile or to joke except a bit nervously, <laughs> self-consciously, as one might, for example, at the boss's jokes, and never, never to act or to say anything silly. Silly, that Monty Python stuff 
mom and dad go for is out. The result of 9-11 has only been to exacerbate this affected bleak style and to spread it far beyond Gen Xers and Gen Yers to the entire New York area and probably beyond. That the piece boldly goes against the grain of all this mostly fake, solemn pretension is only one reason I enjoyed this. Let us have more of this. I know it's boring to hear it again, but laughter is still very therapeutic. This was a gentleman called Louis B. Massano from Jersey City. And my collaborators and I uh, developed our own fan base of Louis B. Massano's we found in the theaters that we filled across Canada and eventually here in Seattle. Um, we had in a way, uh, and hopefully not an inaccurate nod to, to all the youngians here, we had tapped into a collective consciousness that was afraid to speak. Um, and we knew we were onto something that uh, we were in turn attacked from both the left and the right. A satirist sets a badge of honor when everybody attacks him. Or something, so. um, but we also found that many more people, also from the left and right, were cheering us on and uh, waiting for us after the play to say things like, thank you for shouting out what we've all been thinking holding on to and conflicted about. It's important for me to say that it's not that we were simply rallying against the machine and showing off our snarky cynicism. We were making a plea to our community by unveiling the insanity that was unfolding around us while simultaneously hundreds of thousands of innocents were being slaughtered in the Middle East, including the soldiers that were sent there. All the while, the types of Halliburton and other arms dealers and post-war reconstructionists were profiteering. And though the amount has since gone up, a statistic that we shared with our audience, which drew gasps, in particular in Seattle, was that at the time of our play, American families who would lose a son or a daughter in that war would receive a sum of $12,000 gratuity pay while millions were being made off the war. So we were angry young men. And we decided to go on the offensive. We, uh, people were horrified um, at, at the jokes that we made as comedians and writer. But it horrified us that they seemed numb or indifferent to the indiscriminate slaughter that was happening. And it just didn't, compute for us that how we could be found so offensive because things that came out of our mouth and yet so many people were dying and the, and the world was being turned upside down and as the great American satirist Mark Twain uh, said and apparently Kanye West has said this as well <laughs> um, we laugh to keep from crying and this was my personal motto uh, throughout the tumultuous and fun time of that play was that we laughed to keep from crying. So uh, really quickly, just some, some that's Osama, as I mentioned before. Uh, there's a, another actor's playing, And then up there, we were uh, sending up the UN. So we were pay, playing uh, UN peacekeepers in the Middle East and uh, obviously sending it up. OK, we go to the next one. So uh, one of the things uh, on that note before the reading from our play, which was eventually bought board by, uh, yes, as Lahab mentioned, by Talon Books, uh, we actually have, I ha so it's not self-published, it's not on Amazon, and my publisher heard I was coming here, so he made me bring a whole bunch of books. So if anyone's interested, there are some books that you could read. And we actually had a sequel to it. And the sequel was even less popular because we went after Obama at the height of his popularity. Uh, that, that was not good. That was not good. It's also not as good a play as the, as the, as the first one. But um, Another thing I want to point out in terms of context when I read the play, and, I, and, I, and I'm warning you in, in advance, is that my colleague Marcus stopped reading from the play. Uh, I, I, had, I had kind of taken a hiatus from acting for a while. So Marcus would go and read them alone at the uh, university campuses. 
And he stopped doing it because of the, a lot of the younger students were, started accusing us of racism. And they were, they were quite horrified by the language that we used and the racist tropes that we had. We all played different characters. And the premise of Ali and Ellie was based on a, a, a content similar to the picture you see there is from Spike Lee's film, Bamboozled. I don't know if any of you saw it, but that's from a Spike Lee film. And uh, just as uh, he had black actors taking back ownership and in a way reappropriating blackface and the stereotypical tropes around black people, we were uh, taking a page out of his book and uh, taking control of stereotypical tropes and caricatures of Middle Easterners. So in our world of uh, full-on absurdity, no race was safe. We went after everyone. At, and at the time at work, perhaps it's now dated, but it's also interesting to know that we are again in an era where one has to be careful about what one finds funny. Okay, so on that note, um, I think you get the context now, right? I, 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 I've hit the, po the point through. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to read from the play. I'm going to set up the play really quickly in terms of specifically what the story is based on. And then I need a little help from you as the audience. Don't worry, I won't make you act. But. So in this, uh, this is from the book. It says, pretty good synopsis. In this elaborate agitprop theatrical collaboration, the uh, internal contradictions and duplicitous doublespeak of the war on terror are exposed as the propaganda vehicles for the neo-colonialism of the West that they are. Ali Hakim and Ali Ababa, refugees from the imaginary country of Agrabah, attempt to seduce their audience into providing material benefits of Western consumer society, failing miserably at every step. As Yusuf, Ferdeki, and Chai do Shakespeare, Shaw, and Swift one better with an endless string of buffooneries and absurdities derived from an inversion of the cliches defining the geopolitics of the Middle East at the beginning of the 21st century. Informed by the research of Paul Krugman and Noam Chomsky, sent up by the postmodern cultural relativism, relativism of Jean-Paul Jacques Baudary Derrière Dada. <laughs> this political satire is not for the faint of heart. And uh, indeed, it wasn't for the faint of heart, because uh, we started the play, just to give you a sense of how, on the attack, Side, you know, we started the play with a joke that I told about, um, and it was a very grotesque joke. I won't repeat the joke, but I can tell you the joke involved a uh, white uh, accountant being uh, inadvertently sodomized by an Irishman posing as a leprechaun in a man's washroom. <laughs> and I would tell the joke. You just told uh, it. <laughs> I would tell the joke, and then um, Marcus would say, if you found that offensive, you better leave now, because it's all going to go down. <laughs> and we'd wait for the four or five people who needed to leave, to leave and then we'd continue on with the, with the rest of the play. Now, if we go, go back again, sorry, one, one picture. Um, so why are we called Ali and Ali? So Marcus and I are friends. He's, from, he's an Egyptian dad, Californian mom. I'm, I'm Persian, and much to my dad's dismay, because he thinks we're, we're, we're full Persians, authentic Persian race, uh, I'm really a mutt, if you look at my genetics. I don't think there is anything as an authentic race <laughs> when you're in the middle of the Silk Road. But anyway, um, but to this day, we get mistaken as Marcus and Tommy are by, by colleagues who've worked with us. Some with 25 years will see me in the street and go, Marcus, how's, how's, because he runs the New World now, I, I don't. And so we always, as, as young men, had these characters, Ali and Ali. Mine was Ali Hakim, which was the character that I actually played in high school, which was Ali Hakim, the Persian peddler from Oklahoma, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> which, which in my research of the play, I actually found out was, uh, he was veiled. It was really meant to be a Jewish person, but, uh, they, they felt uncomfortable with putting that on stage, so they, but they said, a Persian would be okay, nobody <laughs> uh, And uh, his name was from Prince Ali, and at that time, the um, Aladdin was really big. 
And I don't know if you uh, uh, remember in the movie, there's uh, the carpet flying into Agrabah, which is the country we created. And Agrabah was, we basically put every Middle Eastern history that you could think of into this one country of Agrabah. And uh, in the play, actually, we had, a, at that time, video was very new, so we were quite proud of ourselves. Uh, as the magic carpet of Aladdin is coming down into Agrabah, we had the image morph into an image of the stealth bombers coming into Iraq and destroying targets in, in Iraq, while the beautiful song, A Whole New World, was, was happening. So, um, so for the next segment, so th these guys were refugees, they were hucksters, and they were trying to get gain refugee status, basically. And, and, um, and, and they were constantly putting their foot in their mouths and not realizing that they were offending when they were actually trying to please. And uh, in this particular scene, they notice a celebrity in the audience. Now, we had to contextualize this because race relations are quite, we were talking about this, Martin, and they are quite different in Canada than they are in, in, in Vancouver. So we were hard pressed to find the right character. This is where I need your help. So for us, it was this um, broadcaster on the CBC called Ian Han Hannah Manson. And his actual nickname is Ian Handsome Man Thing. And he's, he's this beautiful brown skinned man, uh, but like the only one as our audible and new news anchors and stuff. So they, they think they see him in the audience. Um, so for the purpose of Seattle, we at that time, the next slide uh, after this one, we chose Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Uh, does anyone remember him? And, and then I thought, well, maybe he's not as big a celebrity, but I landed on Farid Zakaria <laughs> for today. Is that okay? Everyone knows who Farid is? Okay, great. So um, without further ado, and how am I doing? I'm doing okay? You're good. You're okay, good. thank you. So I'm gonna play both alleys, obviously, because Marcus, we tried to get him to come, but he had to spend time with his wife this weekend. Because he tours a lot, so. Um, excuse me while I, oh, there it is. Okay. So, they're talking, and all of a sudden they notice, they stop, and the audience is going, what's going on? And I go up to Ali, up, 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 and I'm like, oh, did you see him? And he's like nodding his head, and then, and then we come back on the stage out of the darkness. And uh, I say, oh, my Sami. Uh, by the way, we used to say, oh, my Sami, because in Agrabah, we had an offshoot of Islam where our prophet was actually Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was a whole thing about that, but we used to say, oh, oh my Sami. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we are tickled pink to announce that tonight, in the audience, we are blessed with the presence of a major American media personality, host on CNN, and our hero, Farid Zakaria. And then we started <laughs> dancing. His picture came up, and I was like gyrating his picture. <laughs> and obviously, we picked some poor person in the audience. Um, we knew you would come, Farid. Holy hookah. <laughs> you are a big cheese in Agraba. That face, look at your face and your skin, rich brown nuttiness. We are very great admirers of you, successful brown person. And we have a proposition for you. Perhaps you are looking to make a lateral move in the world of entertainment from a handsome brown anchor to a handsome brown actor. <laughs> we propose a modest proposal of interest to you and all entertainment industry people here tonight. We at Ali Ali have an idea for a movie big. It's an action movie, an epic, a love story, a quiet drama of personal fortitude. The movie opens. No credits. Some bad motherfuckers come to town. Yes? Some of the worst motherfuckers. They're dirty. They have greasy hair. Ugly clothes from Walmart. 
<laughs> They're dark with a dark purpose. Swarthy, greasy hair. Their underarms are pungent. They're religious fanatics. So, they come to town, these very bad men. Or any town. Hometown. Your town. For what purpose? We do not know yet. We only know that they are fanatics. Well, because they're always praying and muttering and looking sideways out of their squinty, suspicious <laughs> eyes. And jealousy and envy at the material wealth and freedom the people of hometown enjoy, which were bad men, uh, which, which the bad men call decadence, but secretly long for. So they go to a strip bar. Sick, disgusting pigs. They don't even tip after the life. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, in a devastating act of criminal monumentality, they kill themselves somehow and kill many tender, sweet, innocent people who have children or pets, or are children and pets. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> people are understandably upset. They weep. They search for their loved ones among the rubbles, calling out the names, Sally, Tarsell, Pocahontas! <laughs> <laughs> they cry out, who has done this? Who is responsible? Smash cut to your boys, your troops. Good boys, and some girls too. <laughs> and they come. They do not revenge. They want revenge. No, they want justice. They want to liberate people of small, dusty country that had absolutely nothing to do with the unspeakable crime we just saw. <laughs> they have no quarrel with people of small, dusty country. No. <laughs> Therefore, they kill them by the dozens, <laughs> the hundreds, the thousands. Tanks crash houses. Dusty, brainwashed people rush to defend their city. Some of them are burned alive or mangled by machine gun fire. In broken down alleys, they fight hand to hand. A mouthful of dusty teeth meet the butt of a rifle. Gums bleed, eyes pop, women scream. The bodies and pieces pile up. Here a leg, there an arm, everywhere a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> and then more boys, surrounded by the dead and dying villagers, call the remaining people of small, dusty country. <laughs> and your boys, they give the peoples bottles of water. And the sky opens up, and it rains. Think uh, Black Hawk Down meets small, uh, you know, Sinking in the Rain movie. <laughs> it rains. <laughs> Pop-tarts! <laughs> and we push, we push him close to the face of a small, dusty, old woman with poignant violin music. Her face is worn, sorrowful. She looks at the bottle of water in one hand and the Pop-Tart in the other. <laughs> and then at the soldier, this is you, Fanny. <laughs> You're nicely backlit by the setting sun. <laughs> <laughs> and her eyes fill with tears and thankfulness of wonder. She understands this is no ordinary war. These are not soldiers such as they have known from before. Cut! We go into Act Two. In the city, there is a boy. His name is Ali. Because we're all happy. <laughs> he cares nothing for politics or this or that. No, he cares only for football. Uh, soccer, as you people call it. <laughs> this boy plays in the dusty alleys with other boys, using a ball made of rags from his older brother's shirts. <laughs> but this boy playing soccer does not notice the anti-personnel landmine that has been left behind by your boys. A good boys, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> Ali loses his legs, his arms, some of his face. Hey, enough, enough. <laughs> the important thing is we see Ali lying in a hospital bed. He has an indomitable spirit. And your boys are besides themselves when they find out what has happened to Ali. 
For they used to watch him playing with his friends and marvel at his speed and grace and agility. They go to see Ali in the hospital. One of your boys weeps. This is you, Farid. <laughs> and he says, this damned war. But Ali is not angry. He's peaceful. For he has seen how your boys have already transformed his country. How his friends, the urchins of the streets, are happier now. Well, even though their schools are destroyed and they have no running water, and <laughs> their parents are being sexually tortured in the prisons of the former dictator. But anyway, <laughs> as Ali lies in his hospital cot, he speaks of soccer and his hero, the great English metrosexual soccer player, David Benham. <laughs> and how he dreamed of one day playing against Benham, and of course losing, but that would be okay. But it's not good. <laughs> the game would trade shirts with Benham. <laughs> Having won his respect for playing so valiantly. So, your boys climb in a jeep across dangerous territory. They set off hundreds of kilometers, where surely they will encounter pockets of fierce resistance to find the British soldiers. And when the British soldiers hear the story of Ali, they give your boys Benham's shirt. And when your boys set off again, one of the Brits is heard to say, into the darkness of the desert night, this damned war. <laughs> Back in your Jeep there is silence. The sort of silence you get when it's dark and men drive a jeep through hostile territory to deliver a soccer shirt to a boy with no arms. Suddenly, an ambush! Incoming RPG! The jeep explodes in a fireball of fire. Your boys rush out of the jeep, weapons at the ready. And then they realize, the soccer shirt is still in the flaming jeep! <laughs> and meanwhile, the, the enemy is advancing. Uh, scary gibberish music is playing. Scary gibberish music plays. One of your boys plunges into the maelstrom that is a flaming jeep. This is you, Farid. <laughs> <laughs> and while the, the others keep the enemy at bay, they're outnumbered, but they fight on for Ali, for Benham, for transcendence, <laughs> for reasons of personal integrity we may never understand. <laughs> and then, Farid, they hear your call. I've got the shirt! <laughs> <laughs> and it's untouched. It had been under a flame-proof something or other. <laughs> and then, in your excitement, you wave the shirt, and the enemy sees the movement end. A single shot splits the still desert night. And Farid, you fall, still clutching the shirt. Your friends rush to you, but you say, no! Take it! Take the shirt! Get it to Ali! <laughs> I'll hold them off! Get out of here! Go! <laughs> but the leader of the group, this is perhaps Brad Pitt, <laughs> says, none of my boys get left behind. And forming a crude stretcher out of bits of the jeep, they put you, Farid, on it. And then they go berserk. <laughs> Except in English, of course. <laughs> Charging in slow motion, the shells expel from their guns in a languid and glorious balletic choreography, and the enemy is overwhelmed, even though the boys are in slow motion. Your boys, good boys, the best boys, jog the hundreds of remaining kilometers back to the city, carrying Farid on the stretcher, back to the hospital where they left Ali. They made a promise after all. But when they get there, Ali is dead already. The uh, pretty brown nurse in the starched white uniform with the button missing here, and the shapely legs and the pillow. Hey, hey, enough, enough, enough. <laughs> Salma Hayek, perhaps. <laughs> She says, Ali died happy, knowing they'd bring the shirt. Only he couldn't wait that long. They needed him in heaven to play soccer. And she cries, falling into your manly arms, Farid. You are healing quickly, by the way. And the boys, their faces are hard. The things they have seen, the prices they have paid, and it's too much for one of them. And he tears off his special forces shirt, 
and he puts on the soccer jersey crying out, I am Ali! <laughs> they feel a special bond with the young Ali. And Farid, crazed with grief and sorrow, you rush into a machine gun nest and with your bare brown hands you tear it apart. <laughs> the enemy attacks you but you squish them like so many mosquitoes. <laughs> In a moment of great heroism and poignancy, you pass from this world to the next. You are transcendent. You are fulfilling your destiny. Back at the base. It is Asian Heritage Night and the soft sounds of a Hawaiian luau drift into the tent when the rest, the rest of the company sits in a circle. They're solemn now, slouched against their cots, some smoke, some stare numbly at their hands. But it is you, Farid, that they think of, their fallen comrade, the one who dared to die for something a little bit more. <laughs> and as we pull back from the tent, up high into the air, the hot desert wind blows, whipping the tattered remains of a child's soccer jersey up from the dusty streets, up above the prefabricated tents, up past old glory herself. But in the distance, we hear the thin wail of the Ma'ezin calling the faithful to play. Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar. Oh, kill all the white guys. I think I smell an Oscar. <laughs> very much so that was fun reading that for you. Um, now it's question time. <laughs> if you have any questions. It's fine if you don't either. Yeah. I don't have a question, but you've really helped me understand why I've been watching SNL since the beginning of 2018 religiously because because it involves the absurdity and the insanity in a way that is um, feels healthy actually. Otherwise, I don't know what would happen to me. So you just really helped me understand. Because I was like, what is wrong with me? I'm just sort of watching SNL, you know. Yeah. But now I totally get it. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Now, did you write your play before or after uh, Bill Maher got kicked off the television? Got kicked off the television for um, saying that the terrorists were not cowards. I think it was well before that. I don't quite remember, but we were started writing the play um, in 2001. It was well. We started writing the radio piece right after that, and really, the the straw that broke the camel's back <laughs> was the, the the stuff that was going on with Sonera Tabani and our local people. So we always like to question, like, what, what, why, why are we doing this? Why are we metal? Why are we not doing a satire in Canadian politics? But Canada was quite wrapped into it at that time, and and I think that uh, we were also frustrated that there weren't there weren't others that were. So I think it was before that. I think that might have been two thousand and four when that happened with Bill Maher. Any other questions? Okay, well, yeah. Uh, I'll just ask real quickly. I notice the sense of humor is so. Oh, I'm sorry. I notice the sense of humor is so good that for that time. Yeah. Has it been? Has have you had any pushback or questions about the use of the humor that is both of that era and of that place, the cultural implication? Yeah. We have so recently uh, as a. And that's what I was alluding to when my fr friend Marcus really felt, started to feel self-conscious and asking whether it's appropriate for him to, to do the play at universities. And also without having really the time given to establish the context. Uh, not because of the political stuff, actually. I mean, by now, a lot of the things that we bring up in the, in, around the politics and the 
reconstruction of Iraq and all of that, it's, 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 it's old news now. A lot of people are, 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 are aware of that history. It was more around the, the racial politics. And the idea, it was very difficult. Actually, even at the time and in Montreal, there was one, one reviewer. So um, we also sent up Canadian things. So in, in Canada for a while, the most popular play that got funded by the governments were these earnest plays about, about um, young immigrant families and, and how they were dealing with their, with their role in the society being from that. And they sort of started to become very milk toast and cheesy. So in, in one of our, our, so Ali and Ali do a series of these plays and they're actually the same play that they're trying to fool the audience, they're different, but one time it's a Russian family, one time it's a Chinese family, and so on. And, and um, in the version that's a Chinese family, uh, we actually purposefully mix up, like, they're Chinese, but then in the, the dad is, is, is like uh, killing a cat for their dinner. And at the end, he, he commits Harry, Harry Kiri for the Japanese do. When, when he loses his son. And this particular reviewer didn't get that we were doing that on purpose and said, these guys are so racist, they don't know the difference between Chinese and Japanese, oh, right? Okay. Or uh, we had a, you know, you saw at the beginning, I played a character of a, of a um, airport security guard, and most of our airport security guards were South Asian, so, and his name was, Dr. Panir Nehru, Khosru, Gandhi, whatever, any name you, we could put on it. And, uh, and I was told later that I can't do that anymore, that that's like the equivalent of, of black, the, the, me putting on brown face for that. For that. So on a, on a cultural level, it started to become hot. The problem for, with, with that is that as somebody, even as a dormant satirist now, it made me want to read it even more out loud. It made me want to question. <laughs> Why? Why? Why is it? Why? Uh, why is it the society at certain points decides there's certain things you can say and there's certain things you can't? Now, obviously, I know the reasons why, and we we have to be careful about um, about being irreverent just for the sake of being irreverent, which is something that sometimes I find in the modern iterations of things like not SNL so much, but other other comedy like this. It's just irreverence. It's not really for any purpose other than to, to be demeaning. We solved the problem where we were just demeaning to everybody. Like we, whether you're white, black, Chinese, Persian, and so on, but we were self-deprecating as well. And I think that was the important thing, that we weren't, it wasn't from a pedestal. It was more about, look at all of us. Look at how absurd we all are in this scenario. Not a long-winded answer, but yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, if you're interested, uh, that's, I've got a few copies. They're, they're, they're uh, our gift to you if you want to grab a coffee. I think the, the, the second one is really interesting because we decided, we purposefully decided, we wanted to put our money where our mouth is because we felt by, uh, by the time it got published that actually George W. and Dick Cheney were all easy targets, as was Osama. So we, we thought, well, let's see how Obama's doing and his, his people are doing right now. And we did it in the context of that one's called the deportation hearings. And at that time, we had five um, uh, Canadian uh, immigrants of, of various Arab backgrounds, some were from Syria, some were from Iraq, that were being, uh, they were the first five people who were held and tried under our detention laws that had come up after 9-11 where the charges against them were very hidden. They're, they're, to a certain degree, they seemed quite spurious, and they weren't getting the, the, um, the, 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 the defense that they needed to get under what we thought Canada was supposed to do. So we recreated those. Marcus and Guillermo, uh, who lived in Toronto, went and saw a lot of those, what they were allowed to see of the trials. And we put Ali and Ali on trial during that era. So we recreated the, 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 the detention hearings and that was all happening under under uh, Barack Obama's watch at that time. So yeah. So we had fewer fans at that time. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Cam. Thanks for listening. Thank, thank you. you.